All right. We're going to stick to our schedule. We've stuck to the schedule all day, and I'm not going to start losing now. Um, welcome, everyone, to our final panel of the day. Um, thank you so much to our audience in person, watching online and on C-SPAN. Um, um, the day's conference on the freedom of thought, the final panel um, focusing on freedom of thought in higher education. I'm Alita Cass, Vice President for Strategic Initiatives and Director of the Freedom of Thought Project. Um, I want to turn things over to our panel and moderators. Just thanks in advance to the panelists for um, preparing and coming to engage in some really interesting um, conversation, taking, I think, some of the themes from the day, but then applying them in the context of higher education. And thanks especially to our moderator, Judge Kyle Duncan. Judge Duncan sits on the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, and um, we're delighted to have him here to moderate our final panel of the day. Judge Duncan, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, and thank you for inviting me. It's a great privilege. Um, this, this is um, a, a panel that uh, we were talking on our call yesterday about what the uh, panelists were going to talk about, and it struck me that this is a subject on which, um, uh, you, you know, conservatives, right-leaning people can reasonably disagree. So I, I hope to see some reasonable, maybe even some vigorous disagreement on the issue um, the, the, the problem, of course, we'll talk about is, is one that I don't think any reasonable person could disagree about, uh, which is that there is a problem of academic freedom, uh, of freedom of thought, of freedom of speech uh, in higher education uh, from all sorts of different angles. Um, the problem that we'll talk about is what can one do about it? What can the state do about it? Should the state do anything about it? Uh, would the state intervention uh, be counterproductive? Um, uh, would, it, would it make things worse? Or does the state have an obligation to intervene when there is such a, a problem of such magnitude in an institution so important to our civic life? And so to uh, bring to bear their thoughts on this matter, we have a great panel assembled and let me introduce them and turn it over to them. Uh, uh, first, uh, to my immediate left is Mark Bauerlein. Uh, who is an editor at First Things and a professor of English Emeritus at Emory University. He's taught there since 1989. Uh, from 2003 to 2005, he served as director of the Office of Research and Analysis at the Nation National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, he's written ed or edited 12 books, uh, and I won't read them all to you, but my favorite title uh, of the, well, my favorite two titles are The Dumbest Generation, how the Digital Age Stupefies Young Americans and Jeopardizes Our Future. And then the sequel uh, coming 14 years after that, The Dumbest Generation Grows Up from Stupefied Youth to Dangerous Adults. And I just asked Mark if he was planning a third book. Is this a trilogy? Uh, maybe the title could be The Dumbest Generation Dies. <laughs> <clears throat> I don't mean to express any opinion on the matter. Um, and uh, uh, last thing, uh, Mark has written for everywhere and everyone and appeared in all sorts of uh, important places. Uh, and, and in January 2023, with particular relevance to this panel, he was appointed a trustee of New College Florida by Governor DeSantis. Um, and to, are you, no, not, it's not at the end of the panel there, we have Joe Cohn, uh, who serves as the director of FIRE's Legislative and Policy Department. Uh, Joe is a 2004 graduate of the University of Pennsylvania Law School and the Fells Institute of Government Administration. Um, let's see, um, he graduated from UNLV uh, undergrad where he co-founded the student chapter of the ACLU and he's a former staff attorney for the United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit and a law clerk in the Philadelphia Court of Common Pleas. Uh, and he's done many other important things as well that I'm gonna skip over. Uh, Andrew Ferguson, uh, the current Solicitor General of Virginia, appointed by Attorney General Jason Miares. Uh, prior to that, um, he served as Chief Counsel to uh, Leader McConnell in the United States Senate. Uh, he is a graduate twice over of the University of Virginia and the University of Virginia Law School. He clerked for Judge Henderson on the D.C. Circuit and Justice Thomas on the Supreme Court. Uh, he also practiced law at several D.C. firms, including Bancroft PLLC. Uh, and has worked for other very important people in the Senate. 
uh, and we're glad to have him. Uh, and then finally, Professor John Hasnas, Professor of Business and Professor of Law uh, at Georgetown. Uh, he's also the Executive Director of the Georgetown Institute for the Study of Markets and Ethics at the McDonough School of Business, Georgetown. Um, he's done many important things and taught many important places. And he has his BA in Philosopher from Lafayette College, or do they say Lafayette? In Louisiana, we say Lafayette. Uh, his JD and PhD in legal philosophy from Duke and his LLM in legal education from Temple Law School. And as um, Alita said, I am Judge Kyle Duncan. And so we will let me turn over the panel now to Mark. Take it away. Thank you, Judge Duncan. Uh, uh, glad, to, glad to be here and, and talk about the situation. Uh, I'm not a lawyer. I'm an English professor. <clears throat> so. I will just try to serve to set a context for some of the uh, more legal issues that follow. And the context, of course, is, is higher education, is the university. And I pose a question, is there any uh, more uh, uh, signal indication of the uh, utter incompetence or betrayal of the Republican Party than the uh, public universities in strongly red states. Any, any stronger uh, uh, signal of the failure of the conservative movement than higher education in, in the United States? All you have to do to understand that is to go to a red state, a, a comfortably red state, run by a governor, a conservative legislature, and click on the website of the School of Education in the main public university in that state and go ahead and look at the practices, the policies, the premises of it and ask whether those are in accord with the vast majority of conservative voters in the state, not to mention the conservative politicians who run the state. What's been happening is they, they, that that has been turned over to progressivist, uh, progressivist ideas and personnel and they continue even, even today. And the hard progressivism of those schools of education. You can also include the humanities departments, the arts departments, uh, the softer uh, social sciences, even in some of the sciences, uh, such as public health, and see that in, in those places, academic freedom is, is sorely constrained. That's a soft way of putting it. There are areas of discussion you simply don't touch unless you tow the, the party line. If you're, you know, issue, you know the, the topics, gender and sexuality, race, U.S. history, uh, world history, family formation, male-female difference, uh, climate. These are all areas in which a dogma has been laid down and if you cross the dogma, you're, you're in trouble and, and we see that time and again, and I don't mean just the extreme examples, the newsworthy occasions such as what, what Judge Duncan, uh, under that disgusting moment at Stanford uh, not too many weeks ago, where you saw right in front of you uh, the, the coercion, the intimidation uh, taking place. I mean actually the regular normal practices of colleges and universities and how they violate academic freedom and they corrupt uh, peer review. I mean, does anyone here uh, doubt that admissions offices in selective universities are hives of mendacity? Uh, they've got to get around uh, the law in order to get that entering class with the proportions that, that they strive for. Uh, when you look at hiring practices, how many universities uh, include a, in the application packet, a diversity statement, which is really a litmus test. It, it's a political uh, bending of the knee to the, the DEI outlook. If you've been in tenure decisions, uh, you, you know how all these issues are in the room, often unsaid because they don't need to be said. The identity politics can just go without saying because it's in the air. Everyone knows what is supposed to happen and who are the favored candidates. Uh, certain departments, uh, specific departments, are openly political advocacy programs. Uh, women's studies, gender studies, 
uh, black studies, they have a set political outlook. And if you come in and uh, uh, want to be, want to join that department, if you want, if you're a graduate student and you want to do, choose your dissertation, if you want a career, you've got to, uh, once again, observe the, the, the reigning uh, outlook on things, even if you do solid academic work, you follow all the disciplinary protocols, you compile, if you're a social scientist, and you compile the evidence uh, along the, uh, the guidelines laid out by your discipline, if you reach the wrong conclusions, you're in trouble. If you study uh, uh, differences in academic achievement by race, you look at test scores. You better not go to IQ, better not touch that issue, uh, zap, you know, you're, you're done if you, if you talk about that. The DEI policies and programs are squarely contrary to academic freedom and peer review. And I can, I can explain why that is in, in the Q&A if that needs to be explained. I, I did a, uh, after some new college uh, controversies, I mean, the reason why this little postage stamp of a campus with only 650 students should become such a national story, that, that's, that's an issue in itself. But I, I, the Miami Herald editorial board asked me to do a Zoom conference call with, with all of them. And they asked me, you know, are you, you, you've said you're against DEI programs at New College. And I said, that's not what I said. I'm against DEI programs at every single campus on this, on this entire country, and they ought to be terminated tomorrow with extreme prejudice. And they kind of looked at me, you know, with a blank look on their face. No, no apologies, no excuses, done. And they actually asked me to write an op-ed, which I did in the, in the Miami Herald. Um, uh, a few days later, but when they said why, I said Be because you can't do peer review under the pressures of DEI. It corrupts the, the process, the, the sort of the liberal procedures of individual merit and uh, a sort of blindfold uh, in, in terms of your evaluation of candidates and of manuscripts for, I've written, read manuscripts for, for a dozen university presses and a dozen more scholarly quarterlies, and I know the pressures that editors are under. If they publish something like Bruce Gilley's piece on colonialism uh, a few years ago, that editor may be out of a job, even though the editor followed all the standard practices that, that go along with uh, the proper functioning of the, the university. So uh, we, we have a situation here where the institution has, has been corrupted. Uh, academic freedom started going away, you know, a half century ago. And the steady deterioration has been marked by, one, the purging of conservative personnel from college faculty. There were, there were many more conservatives back in 1985 when I was in graduate school at, at UCLA uh, than there are now. Political correctness has never, ever been worse than it is today. My liberal colleagues, the professors who've never voted Republican in their lives, they're nervous. You may have taught Huck Finn for 20 years. You probably you don't teach it now. Big mistake. You have a class of 35 students. You do course evaluations by the end of the semester. If two of those, if 33, great teacher, great class, but you know, wonderful, and two say, I was uncomfortable I felt deeply distressed by having to read Huck Finn. It's got the N-word. Uh, the administration, because it's a federal issue that could come up, especially if they have the student, students of color, uh, you could have three months of hell. You come out of it, you know, okay, I won't teach it again. I'm sorry, I'm offended, doing the usual uh, apology. But the process is the punishment the chill has set in, you're not gonna do it again. And it only takes a few cases for, for everyone else. Who wants the trouble, right? Who wants, who wants to deal with this? So what do you do, uh, and this is sort of the question, I'll pass this along, wrap up. What do you do if you've got an institution that was the modern institution, not the old university, the, the liberal university 
is, is only you know, 140 or so years old, uh, what do you do when the liberal values of, of merit, of individual, individual treatment, disinterested evaluation on apolitical disciplinary criteria have crumbled? What do you do when the people within it won't reform? Because they can't. They can't. The, the, the jobs are on the line. And we don't need how many more cases of people who've been hit because they said something off campus, you know, Amy Wax uh, or, or, or Professor Klein at, at UCLA uh, and his, his refusal to engage in differential treatment of students. I mean, we know all the cases that have happened. What do we do when the campus can't reform itself? Well, so. that is what we will talk about, um, and uh, that is a wonderful introduction to this. I do want to encourage you to try to, to try to like really tell us how you feel in the follow-up <laughs> comments, uh, because I felt like you were holding back a little bit there. But I'm going I'm to try to encourage you. Um, that's a wonderful introduction, and I'm going to hand that off to now to General Ferguson. I should have called you General earlier. I apologize. Um, and. Uh, you're going to give us some thoughts uh, to, to sort of start opening the conversation on, well, what is to be done? Uh, thank you, Judge Duncan. Um, I'm really pleased to be here, and I'm pleased to see so many people who care about, uh, I think, one of the most important topics that conservatives can debate, because um, for better or for worse, and I think increasingly for worse, our future is molded on college campuses. and so. I hope at least we can all agree that the days of don't worry, these kids will grow up when they hit the real world, you know, the reality check will set in, that we can't hope for that and we have to do something about the college campuses now. So I think the question is what to do. And before I propose some ideas, I want to make very clear I'm here in my personal capacity. Hopefully all of the government officials that were here today said this. I'm here in my personal capacity. I don't represent the Attorney General today. I don't represent the Governor just here representing me. Um, so anything I say, hold it only against me, don't hold it against them. I am a lawyer, um, uh, unlike Professor Bauerlein, and so I am stuck thinking about this issue in the way that lawyers do, which involves a lot of reasoning from analogies. And I had not spent a lot of time dealing with the problems of higher education until I joined state government um, and then spent kind of on a daily basis dealing with the problems of higher education. Um, and in trying to come up with ways to think about this, I started to notice some parallels between something that conservative lawyers talk about and think about a lot, which is the administrative state. So when we talk about the administrative state and why we hate it, um, there are a couple reasons. One is it's inconsistent with our constitutional design, and that's important, but if that were the only problem, I don't think we'd all get as animated as we do. It would be kind of uh, objecting to form and not to substance. The real reason we don't like the administrative state is because we don't like being governed by experts, self-proclaimed experts, who are insulated from any accountability from the governed. That's why we don't like it. We don't like the results that such a system of government produces. And particularly talking about public universities, which is what I spend most of my time dealing with, this is what they are. They are organs of the state governed by insulated bureaucrats who have proclaimed themselves experts on their topics, who get to decide who else qualifies as an expert on the topic. And they govern themselves. They take unbelievably huge amounts of public money, resist any public oversight associated with that money, and insist that the way this needs to work is take the money, keep the oversight. We want the money. I mean, there are some people in the room right now who I know have run large academic institutions in Virginia. The large academic institutions in Virginia, including the public ones, spend millions of dollars on lobbyists that they employ in-house to come to the legislature and fight for money and no oversight. And uh, that is, has a remarkable parallel till we talk about the administrative state. The administrative state are agencies run by experts who are not accountable to the public, who make decisions ostensibly on the basis of their expertise that the rest of us have to live with and kind of hope it turns out okay. Hopefully after the way the experts handled COVID, we are all deeply suspicious of entrusting experts with government. 
I think this, we need to think the same about public universities. Um, and, and I think that the main problem is the problem that Professor Bauerlein identified, which is the physician is not going to heal himself. He can't. He's too far gone. We cannot expect the cabals of professors who governs these universities, who decide who else gets to join the cabal, decides who doesn't get to join the cabal, and who ejects dissenters from the cabal. There's no hope, and we can't possibly reasonably expect that these people are going to govern themselves consistently with what we have established these universities to do. And at least particularly for public universities, we pour billions of public funds into these universities to educate our children, to mold future citizens to achieve human flourishing, and to search for the truth. And if the public universities aren't doing that, the public has a very reasonable expectation to ask, what are we spending the money on? The cost of higher education has exploded. An unbelievable amount of nonsense seems to spew from these publicly funded institutions, and we continue to pour money into them. I think the public not only can, should be demanding of their political leaders who are routinely signing off on the money to these public institutions, but not accountable for what comes out of them. What are we spending this money on? I can barely afford to get my kids through college. I'm also taxed to pay for these institutions. And it's not just public institutions. An unbelievable amount of federal money and state money go to private institutions as well. What are we spending the money on? What are they doing? Because the best as I can tell, it's not good. And so in terms of solutions, I think that the frontline solution is the solution in which Professor Bauerlein is actively participating and in which Governor DeSantis has led on and Governor Youngkin is doing the same thing, which is find, figure out, and it's normally pretty straightforward, what the governing mechanisms of these institutions are and subject them to political accountability. And if the current system isn't working, replace the personnel. I mean, you know, m much of my experience from the last five years has been in judicial nominations. And I know that there are some people who have been affected by the judicial nominations process right here in the room right now. But this was sort of my animating theory when I got involved in that too, which is the courts are not producing decisions and judgments that are consistent with the law. We should change the personnel. And we did. I don't see any reason not to take the same approach to public universities. And frankly, I think that as public institutions, that absorb an unbelievable amount of public wealth, but do not have to show what public good they provide. I think politicians basically owe it to their constituents to subject these institutions to substantial oversight and demand and then enforce changes uh, uh, if the physician cannot heal himself. And I'm not an expert on the state of the universities. I saw what happened to uh, Judge Duncan. I've seen what's happened to others. To some extent, I've dealt with it as a, uh, as a lawyer for the government. But if the description of the way that tenure decisions and publication decisions and expenditure decisions are being made that Professor Bauerlein just gave us are accurate, the help has to come from outside. And I think that the only way the help will come from outside are people in government who are answerable to the electorate for what goes on in the government, including for the largest organs of government, which in many states are the flagship state universities. People need to expect their politicians to hold them accountable and to make substantial changes if the product that we are paying for is just not useful to the public at all. If this isn't a way to achieve human flourishing, change it. And if they can't change themselves, change it from the outside. That's what we are electing people to do. Thank you, General. Uh, we will return to you now. Now, two references have now been made to my recent unpleasantness at Stanford. I just want to, assure, I just want to assure everyone that I'm okay, uh, and and I, and I wish I wish Mark would stop touching me though, um, uh, but I have had a lot of therapy now, and I'm okay. I'm okay. I don't wake up screaming about juice and oranges in the middle of the night, but it's okay. All right now. Uh, we will move now to, uh, I think, a different perspective on this uh, from Professor Hasna. So please, Professor, take it away. Thank you. I guess my job is to provide a bit of a counterpoint um, without disagreeing with Mark's characterization of <clears throat> the nature of the culture inside universities. So to a large extent, it is a monoculture. Faculties tend to be ideologically all on the same side. There's a great deal of ideological bias among the faculty. If 
you want to say there's unfairness in hiring. Yeah, from my perspective, there's unfairness in hiring because it's more difficult for people who agree with me to get hired. That's true. They're, the biggest problem that I deal with is that the universities consistently fail to live up to their own policies. Um, I don't want to exaggerate things. Things are much worse in an institution like mine than in many of the ordinary colleges and universities throughout the, the country that are not one of the elite schools where most professors and most students just do their stuff, learn their craft, and go through college in a normal way. But the more you get up to the elite level, the more what Mark described is an accurate description of the culture of the university. I, I'm here. I work at Georgetown University, so I should have a lot of insight into this. Um, FIRE ranked 203 of the top of the schools, the country's universities with regard to their hospitality to freedom of speech. What's the culture like for freedom of speech? Georgetown came in 200. <laughs> there were three below us, but we were at 200. <laughs> However, we've managed to excel in the sense that for in 2023, FIRE awarded us the Lifetime Censorship Award. <laughs> um, well deserved. Okay, so we did earn that. Um, and, I, I, and I will tell you that it's true to say that in the humanities and in the law school, there's a lot of ideological conformity and a lot of ideological hostility to certain positions. But that's not how you earn these reverse accolades. Uh, I've been working inside Georgetown University for 10 years to try to alter policies. And in fact, I have managed to alter two policies. That means I work with the administration all the time. And there are no bad guys in the administration. The deans, the president, the provost, these are not bad people. They're well-motivated people. They care about the good of Georgetown University. Administrators are not ideologues. Faculty are ideologues. Administrators are not. Administrators respond to the incentives built into the structure. They respond to their incentives. And the reason why you get these results that we don't think is a good product is because of the internal incentives within the university structure. Um, I, do, I teach in the law school most of the time. I teach in the business school part of the time. What I've learned from the business school is the effect of organizational behavior features on the way organizations behave. It's not that somebody is out there trying to corrupt the system. It's that people following their incentives end up doing things that produce a result that's completely at odds with the actual goal. Georgetown University has an excellent freedom of speech policy. It's the Chicago statement built in there. And yet we managed to get the censorship award by simply departing from it consistently. And the reason is because this, we don't have anybody in charge of making sure that that's honored. Because the incentives of the parties that are involved are to make problems go away. We have, you know, in business, there's this old saying, you're hoping for A and paying for B. Well, that's what's going on inside the university. That's what the problems are. Things are bad. Our job is to try to make them better. Some of us work within the university to try to do that. I've been doing that for about 10 years. It's a somewhat frustrating exercise. I make a little progress. I get the policy changed, and then we ignore it. That just means I have more work to do. However, the only thing I can think of that would make the situation worse is if we got politicians involved. Yeah, let's get the state telling us what we can do. This, is, this panel is supposed to be about academic freedom. So the way I understand academic freedom is professors, students are allowed to pursue truth, pursue knowledge, pursue their research wherever it leads them, free from sanction and interference by the administration of the university and by the government. That's what academic freedom is. It means we get to argue about truth. Um, 
it seems odd to say, to preserve academic freedom, we have to get the state to regulate it. It's a, it's a little bit oxymoronic, don't you think? And we've done things like that before, and it hasn't worked out that well. I mean, I can remember the McCarthy era where you had to, if you advocated anything associated with the left wing, you would be fired. That's, a, that's the last place we want to go. Um, it's not easy to persuade your colleagues that they're wrong. I'm in a monoculture, I'm the odd person out. My job is to try to change people's opinion. I do my best and I regularly fail. My inability to persuade people I think is unfortunate, but it certainly doesn't suggest that because I can't persuade them, I should have the state come in and win the case for me. Right? The kind of policies that my colleagues are pursuing, I think, are very, very bad policies for all of the reasons that have been described. And I've got to try to change them. But if I have the state able to interfere, like, I have to be careful because I'm talking about George, Georgetown, which is a private university. I don't think state universities are such a good idea, but we have them. If you want to have a state university, then the state determines how much money it gets. The state can determine how much money it gets. But the solution to the fact that you don't like the product being put out by state universities is not to abrogate academic freedom. It's not to have the state control so that they put out the right product. If you don't like the product, don't pay for it. You, know, you want to cut the amount of money that's going in because you think it's not doing the job right? I guess that's a political decision. But in order to correct what's going on inside universities, even state universities, it seems like a bad idea to abrogate academic freedom. It's true that professors are not held accountable to the administration and to politicians for the products that they put out, for their research, for their conclusions. And when I make some points, and everybody thinks I'm an idiot and wants to condemn me for what I'm saying, that goes with the territory. It's not easy defending freedom. It's not supposed to be easy to defend freedom. It's not easy being the outlier when everybody else disagrees with you. But that's our job. We don't need outside enforcement. We have all the enforcement we need inside the system, we just are not brave enough to use it. Using Georgetown for an example, a couple of years ago, two adjuncts were fired for what they said, direct violation of our speech policy. Clear. And what did they do? They left. They didn't fight. They left. Had either of them, I'm also the chair of Georgetown's um, faculty grievance code committee. Had either of those people decided to bring a grievance against the law school dean, it was a sure winner. It could have, we could have said, you can't do this, but they left. We had the same problem last year with Ilya Shapiro. He wasn't sanctioned. But had he continued in the job and been sanctioned, if he brought a grievance, it would win. We need people willing to stand up and fight, and even if the, even if the grievance committee goes the wrong way. Then you get to sue, because the policies are part of our contract with the professors. And although the administration may be um, worried about incentives, there's one party who's has, who has the right incentives, and that's university council. Yeah. University council cares only about one thing. Don't let the university get sued. And the surest way for it to get sued is for it to violate its own policies. Once people start showing that if we don't honor our commitment to freedom of speech, if we violate the tenets of academic freedom, the university's at risk for lawsuits, that party has all the incentive to try to change behavior. You know, our training for incoming students is terrible. That's changeable. Why would, any, why would they change it? There's no incentive yet. Threat of lawsuit, that'll change it. The pot, we have a problem. Our job as academics is to deal with it. 
we have an enforcement mechanism that we don't use, the most destructive thing we can do is invite outside political interference to make sure that we're putting out a good academic product. I mean, academic freedom is supposed to be we explore, we talk about, we discuss, we search for, tr search for truth. And then if it doesn't come out my way, I'm stuck with that. I have to try to change minds. But if it doesn't come out my way, I don't get to say, OK, everybody else is wrong. Let's have the state make it so that things come out right. Okay. That's an extremely dangerous and damaging route to take. We've done it in the past, and it's been disastrous. So I think we should not repeat it in the present. Professor, thank you. I know you will get to say more on that subject as we go forward, but uh, I will t now turn it over to our final panelist, uh, Joe Cohn, and, and I know he will speak, uh, take, take some, I, I think, perhaps somewhat of a middle position between the last two speakers. Thank you so much, Your Honor, and it's such a great pleasure to be here with my fellow panelists and at a conference. Uh, about freedom of thought that even has a fire emoji behind me. Uh, it's a tremendous delight. So I'm Joe Cohn, the Legislative and Policy Director at the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression, or as we're better known, FIRE. And we are equal opportunist critics. And, you know, that does put me in a position here of being able to describe, you know, what, you know, a lot of common ground that I have with each one of the, of the panelists and some, you know, disagreement as well. The first thing you know, I want to point out, I think, uh, some consistency across the panel is that uh, none of us think that everything that's going on in higher ed is well-oiled, smooth running operating machine. We all see a tremendous amount of room for improvement. I do think it's important to remember, though, that there's never been a golden age uh, of academic freedom, free speech, you know, et cetera, in higher ed or anywhere else. So it's a constant, and it's going to always be, regardless of what we do, a constant thing that we need to be engaged on. But what I want us to really think about is how we take an approach to this problem that doesn't trade one set of constitutional issues and problems for another. And what I mean by that is that I don't have any horse in the race whether or not academia, academia is dominated by the left or the right. I don't want it dominated by either. So when I look at and evaluate proposals, I want to see what they do to elevate you know, the voices that are being chilled and not whether or not they silence people whose voices are in the majority. Uh, what I'm really looking for is how do we establish you know, a free speech culture and a culture of academic freedom? Because I agree with uh, Professor Hasness uh, with respect to the fact that academic freedom is primarily about insulating students and faculty from external pressures, either from the administration or from the government. And so that's why I look at the different policy proposals that are put forth uh, in different states and I evaluate them each independently and don't take an all or nothing approach of they're all you know, hunky dory or they're all trash. And some of them are mixed bags, where there are some provisions that are really helpful and other provisions that aren't. So give with one hand and take with the other. So uh, I'll start by, by comparing some of the different approaches and different contexts that this has been uh, fought in, in the different state legislatures. And I'll just list them real quickly. We, we're, you know, we've seen efforts to regulate the DEI administrative apparatus. We've seen efforts to regulate uh, curriculum and what ideas can be in college classrooms. We've seen uh, not in bills necessarily, although one or two that responded to this problem, efforts by government officials to try to punish faculty for uh, expression on matters of public concern inside the classroom and outside of the classroom on Twitter, uh, et cetera. Um, and we've seen efforts to either eliminate or reform uh, tenure. So all of these things are kind of in this ecosystem of pieces of legislation that are percolating throughout the states. And they all need to be thought through uh, separately in terms of the legal implications and the social implications of it. And let me just start by saying, you know, uh, I'll start with, with one where I think, you know, is, uh, you know, helpful. And, uh, where I don't agree that it's appropriate for us to just take a step back and let the institutions themselves just do whatever they want to do. When we're talking about 
administrative enforcement of DEI. We're not talking about whether or not that concept of diversity is worthwhile and whether or not institutions should be doing things to make sure that they are productive places for people to learn of all different types. We're talking about overhanded approaches to it that squeeze out dissenting views. We're talking about the kind of political litmus test that Professor Borlein was talking about that screen out dissenters either at the point of hire or at the point of you know, whether they're being considered for promotion or tenure. And I think it's perfectly appropriate uh, for the government to say, you know what, there are some things we're not going to let you use when in the hiring process, in the promotion process to evaluate candidates. And that's why you see groups like the Manhattan Institute and like FIRE crafting model pieces of legislation that say that those kind of questions that you know, a lot of survey data, data, some that's run by FIRE itself, shows are being used as described as political litmus tests are off the table. But what I also want us to think about when you're crafting that in state law is to not trade one political litmus test for another. So how about no political litmus tests? Not just this is the one issue that we're particularly sensitive about that we don't want you, you know, screening out dissenters. Don't screen out dissenters. Okay, you know, you know, it's craft things carefully to make sure that you can still evaluate a faculty member's actual work in the subject area, but don't just screen people out. Curricular bans. Curricular bans are unconstitutional. I'm going to say that full stop. And this is a somewhat in response to the prior panel's you know question about you know the Stop Woke Act. So far, there have been over a dozen state legislatures that have introduced bills that would say certain ideas around race and gender are prohibited from discussion in the college classroom. Of those states, only one bill was enacted in that form that said these ideas, de facto discriminatory, may not be uttered in the college classroom. That state is Florida. That's the Stop Woke Act. Fire's lit Fire and others have litigated against it, and it's currently enjoined. And that's because there's over 60 years of legal precedent saying there's no idea that you can bar from college classrooms. So these ideas are not all created equal in terms of the legislative solutions. And I'm going to just go really quickly because I don't want I want to make sure we have more time for a conversation here. No, you will we'll have time to go through more, the, but I, I would like to hear the a, other one two, more view. The yeah, other more. you know two productive things I'll be really fast about is tenure. Uh, tenure has been instrumental in defending the rights of professors who have minority viewpoints from being you know, purged from the academy. Now, we might want reforms in terms of how tenure is granted, but there's no question that it has been helpful in making sure that those who are in charge can't just purge conservative voices. I'm not saying that tenure is the only way to protect free speech, but maybe gutting it without putting something better in its place is not the way to go. And while talking about what's better in its place, having statutory protections for faculty to be able to speak their minds on matters of public concern is something that legislatures absolutely can appropriately uh, do. And the last point I want to make, and then I will close on this, is that what I find so interesting about this discussion of late is the reversal of the political parties on this. For years, FIRE has been telling those on the left that in the tension between equality and free speech, you must allow free speech. The chips should fall where they may. But now you have conservative legislators saying these ideas are so bad that they must not be allowed to be spoken. That's the Stop Woke Act and others like it. And I'm here to tell anyone on either side of the political spectrum that when you prioritize the equality over speech, you are in the wrong here. And, uh, and, and with that, I would say I'm really looking forward to the rest of the conversation with my fellow panelists. Uh, it's a great honor again to be here. Thank you. Excellent, excellent. I think, um, I think in, in, I'm not gonna interject anything, frankly. I, I just wanna hear Mark's, um, if I may start with you, if, um, if you would respond, it, 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 I think at some level we do have an agreement on there, that there's a problem, I think. Do you, do you agree that everybody on the panel sees the same problem, or do you think the problem is somewhat different than is being characterized by somebody? Or say whatever you want. I, I think we probably disagree more on the degree of the problem, the degree to which the university has, has been corrupted, the, re, the degree to which, again, regular, normal, routine practices violate 
academic freedom. Not just the extreme cases, the ones that get the publicity. It really is, again, the standard operating procedures that have become, again, just like the air that people breathe. On, on campus, which again is, is in a way more, more debilitating, right, than, than, the, than the open aggression, right, toward, toward conservatives. So it would be, it's not that conservatives have been drummed out of the professorate, it's just that over time, those conservative professors who there were retired and, and younger conservatives weren't, weren't hired. It's, it's, that, it, it, it's that process and that they weren't hired because of their traditionalist outlook on, on things. Now, again, what do you do about, about that kind of thing? Again, it's slow, takes place you know, year after year. I mean, God and Man at Yale was what, 1952? The Closing of the American Mind was 1987. Uh, you know, the, these, these Concerns have been around for a long, long time. And my, my dismay, and I'll just wrap up with this, is the Oberlin decision. Oberlin got slammed, mm -hmm. as it deserved to, to get slammed badly. I don't see, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't see that that has changed the behavior of any, any administrators, any, any universities. Well, let me just... Uh, let me ask you though, so you say God and Man at Yale was in the 50s and then we had the closing of the American mind and so presumably there's been discussion and there's been some ferment on these ideas and yet you said in your opening remarks that things have quote never been worse than today and you described universities as quote hives of mendacity. Um, which is which I'm going to write, I'm going to put that in an opinion, not, not on this subject of course, but I just, it's got a nice ring to it. Citation. Uh, no citations, yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, unless you, uh, yeah, m maybe, uh, to a literary journal, I don't know, is that, that's not even secondary authority, but, um, so, so why, why is it worse, never been worse than today, don't we learn from history, don't we learn from doing bad things, so now we can do good things, why are, why are things worse, never, and I'm not, I'm not disputing that they're never been worse, but why are they worse today than in the past? Very broad, a very broad answer to that, which again is is a is a, is a tentative answer, and, and that is that the social movements of the 60s and 70s, the civil rights movement, and then women's lib, and then the the gay rights movement had a certain moral authority that gave moral authority to identity politics, mm -hmm. and the conservative movement in the 70s they just gave up on 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 the education world, the, except in the areas of law and economics. They went all in on law and economics and say, you know, those humanities people, the arts people, just, you know, they, they, they do their, their own thing. And I think it was the left understood, you know, the old downstream politics uh, from, from culture. The left understood, you know, we lost, we lost in 70, we got hammered in 1972, and then we got hammered in 1980 and 84, we got to do our long march through different institutions. Education, media, entertainment, publishing, the art world, that's where we get in. And you know, I was a big, I was a big liberal when I came out of graduate school in 19, 1990. I'm working at Emory and boy, suddenly, queer theory, it was the thing. All the energy was going into the, uh, uh, that field in, in the humanities. In 1985, you never saw it. By 1995, all the journals were filled with the words transgression, subversion, right, heteronormativity. It, it, was, it was astonishing, but we all looked and said, okay, you know, they do their own little, you know, their, their own little sexuality stuff in, in, in that world, and the rest of us will, will, will go on. Well, we didn't know they'd end up in the Obama administration. They won. They, we, we, we misconstrued the, the force of this socio-cultural Outlook, and and I mean I went conservative, you know. In in you know I had a child, and then, you know the aughts, and I realized, boy, did I did I uh, did I underestimate this uh, this movement? That's not a satisfying answer, but that's I'm curious about your reaction to one thing, and then I want to ask Andrew something. Uh, Professor Hasnes um, describes this as an elite problem. I think that's what you said, an elite problem 
sort of this is, this, these are the things that are going at the Yales and the Georgetowns. But there's a large group, I don't know if you said a large group, but a, a significant group of universities where professors and students are just doing their thing. Um, and I, you know, I want to believe that's, that's true. Certainly, do you agree with that or do you think that's I, right or not? I, I actually don't, don't think that that's true. I think it's just as bad at Cal State LA as it is at, at UCLA. Uh, I think in the more, uh, the more empirical you get, right, uh, engineering schools in, in uh, A&M schools, and maybe the, the schools that are more oriented toward, you know, certification, the, the, the labor market, le less so. But I, I, I do think it's drifting down uh, uh, farther, okay. farther, farther than Professor okay. Andrew, um, so you, you, you seem to be on the panel the one most uh, sanguine about state intervention or the most that that's necessary. And yet we heard from the other two panelists that there's, there's an important value called academic freedom. Um, and I noted down two aspects of that. The first is insulation from external pressures. And the second one is um, in order that we can pursue the truth in the university. So do you have a response to, I think, the implicit criticism, which is if we have aggressive state intervention, then we're going to um, erase, uh, we're going to damage what makes the university a, uh, an important social. It, 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 we're going we're to compromise its important social function if we do that. Uh, yeah, uh, that's a good question. And I think it's a, that's a legitimate criticism. <clears throat> and I think that's also, you, you know, uh, one of the best criticisms of government intervention in any market is the unintended after effects. Um, you know, the idea that good intentions uh, are, are great, but um, they don't justify regulation. I, I think here, though, the, the, you know, the point of academ academic freedom is, is security from external pressures. I certainly think that's one of the means we've used to secure academic freedom. I, I don't think that's an end of itself. And I think that we now confront this problem where you have you know, these tenured cabals defining orthodoxy and imposing tremendous pressure on dissenters, um, effectively amounting to a heckler's veto, um, that say, toe the line of this orthodoxy or you will be excluded from the profession. Um, and, you know, I, I, I guess my question is, if you have this sort of, uh, you know, that is pressure external from the speaker, but it's internal to the institution. And mm -hmm. I guess the question is, if you have this sort of malignant internal pressure um, that, is, that is resisting the kind of unalloyed search for the truth, um, is external pressure to defend the right to search for the truth really that bad? And I think the answer is no. We use government regulation to promote the First Amendment all the time. I mean, look, if you're marching down the street protesting something and a gang of thugs shows up to beat the crap out of you because of your position, the First Amendment is a meaningless parchment barrier if the government doesn't promptly intervene to protect the rights of the speaker. That's the principle of the heckler's veto. All of our First Amendment rights are only, uh, only go so far as the government is willing to secure them against the heckler's veto. I just don't understand why we wouldn't say the same for the university. If a tenured cabal is willing to show up and in the case of, in some cases, physically obstruct speakers from pursuing the truth, I don't understand why we wouldn't say it's time for someone outside of the institution to intervene. And something that Professor Hassan has said, with which I strongly agree, I just, I, I, I see the way to achieve it very differently, is his view, and it sounds correct to me, although I don't have an insider's take, is that the problem for university administrators is one of incentives. That they have the apparatuses in place but they don't have internal institutional incentives to use those apparatuses to defend these important values. I agree, I agree. The incentives have to be changed and the physician won't heal himself. That's the point, especially for public institutions. If the, if the physician is sick, it needs to be healed by someone else. And I think that's the point. The incentives are bad, they are terrible, they need to be changed, and we can't expect the people subject to those incentives to change them on their own. They have no incentive to do so. And in terms of um, uh, my, my friends down the panel, and it's nice to be, uh, every time that fire is on my desk, they're writing a brief opposing something I'm about to say. Um, and so it's nice that we have some, some agreement here. Um, but, one of the things that I've heard my friends say is that we need to resist the idea of kind of state regulation. 
which at least in my mind generally describes some sort of like intrusion into an otherwise operating market. Uh, I do think that there probably are circumstances where that's called for, but I think at least in the first instance, I'm proposing something considerably more modest. Maybe adjust the spigot of money that flows out of every state capital and out of Washington to these universities, sight unseen, irrespective of the way they treat their students and the way they treat their faculty. These are public investments. I don't know why we would be surprised that the public would say, hold on, if you aren't actually searching for the truth, if you aren't participating in the achievement of human flourishing, that's fine. We aren't going to come for you and throw you in jail, but we're not going to give you access to public funds. The point of public funds is to achieve public goods, and if you aren't doing it, no more public funds. And I, you know, I, I do think there probably are some circumstances in which more government intrusion is probably called for, but at the very least, if we're going to continue dumping tens and hundreds of billions of dollars into these institutions, let's expect them to put it to a use that is a public good. Um, so I, I want to—I I do want to address a question, Professor Hasnes, But Joe, you just raised your hand. If so I can jump in real quickly, I'll recognize you. Thank you. I okay. appreciate it, Your Honor. Um, you know, I actually think that there's a good amount of common ground on, on this point. But it needs to be refined a little bit because what I'm concerned about is not the question of regulation or not, but what does your regulation look like? It's one thing to say, you know, this year as we're considering your budget, we're also going to be putting in a stronger cause of action for people who have been censored. And, you know, that's going to be in it. You know, we're going to make sure that people who have been censored have an opportunity better to defend themselves. It's one thing, you know, to say that you're going to provide due process rights and, you know, in campus hearings. You know, you're coming in to me, you're asking me for gazillions of dollars. We're going to insist that you do certain things. And we're going to insist that you protect the academic freedom rights of even, you know, your, your professors who say the most controversial things, including, you know, teaching Huck Fenn if they want if you're going to come to us and ask us for money. But what I'm concerned about is when the Appropriations Committee instead says, if you teach what I don't want you to teach, then I'm not going to give you, you know, the money because you're not talking about whether or not Virginia can do it. If Virginia can do it, so can California and so can Alabama and so can every other state. And what ideas each state chooses to take off of the table in the strong arming of the budget is going to be different. So that's why I do think there's an appropriate you know, kind of role here uh, in, in regulating. But we need to be careful that you're always talking about enhancing voices and not silencing voices in all of the state you know, regulations, not some of them. Thank you. Did you did you just want one to, quick uh, response? Uh, that point is well taken, but at least for public universities, and again, I'm sorry for the sort of insistence of my focus on this. It's just what I normally deal with. Someone is deciding what will be taught and what will not be taught, and in public universities, it's always the government because the curriculum decisions made within public universities are made by the government. So we are not having a debate about whether the government should make these decisions or not. They are making them. They're making them. The cabal of professors who makes these decisions about what curriculum, what curricula will be taught and whether you are sufficiently within the scope of the orthodoxy to participate in these decisions, that's the government. It is the government. So the question we are deciding is, is an accountable wing of the government going to make these decisions or is an unaccountable wing? And my preference as a conservative, particularly after years of resisting the administrative state, is the accountable wings should make these decisions. Thank you. Uh, Professor, I wanted to ask you, and we will have time for questions. We're going until 5.15, and so in a few minutes we'll open it up for questions. I wanted to ask you a couple of things, Professor. Um, one was very practical. You said you, you had managed to change some internal policies at Georgetown over the years, uh, and I'm sure that required a heroic effort on your part. But then you, you also said, I believe, that uh, policies are re routinely ignored and not enforced. And so you pointed to the necessity of changing incentives. So wh what are some of the incentives you have in mind that, would be, that could be changed uh, that, that would actually have a helpful sort of you know, uh, impact, as opposed to just changing words on a piece of paper? Yes, so you're asking, I can give you specifics. Yeah. You're asking for specifics. So for Georgetown, we have a good freedom of speech policy. Mm -hmm. it's, it's Chicago principles. Right. Yet we have nobody who's assigned responsibility for seeing that's enforced. Now we've got executive vice presidents across the board who are, whose job is to make sure that things function normally, that the students don't go off on protest. We've got lots of people responsible 
for making sure that everything else works, and nobody who's a champion for freedom of speech. So when the parties get together and decide how to act, there's no one speaking for freedom of speech. Another thing we could do that I've been working on without success is to have the policy, have a statement added to the policy which says if you, a complaint directed against someone is based purely on the content of their speech, it will be dismissed without investigation because the way things work now, the investigation itself turns into the punishment. Somebody says something that's improper, next three months they're you know, on leave. So that's another thing that can be done. Um, the other thing is to change, you know, it should not, be. we have a very good speech policy at Georgetown. Its purpose is to restrain the extent to which the administrators, meaning the deans, the provost, the DEI people, can interfere with students and faculty's freedom of speech. The parties charged with enforcing the policy are the deans, the provost, and the DEI people. It's not surprising that the policy is not effect you know, effectively enforced. That, rem yeah. that reminds me of something Justice Scalia said about, uh, you know, the, yeah. there are many uh, bills of rights and the, you know, constitutions of the, of the satellites of the Soviet, Soviet Union. They're not enforced because they have no governmental structure that would right. lead to The analogy I use when I write about this is that the Soviet Union had an excellent protection for freedom of speech right. in Article 50. Right, you could read it, just, it in the gulag. It just means nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it just means nothing. You know, and just on this point, um, it's, it's not, I, I, try, I think that it's a big problem, but we're overgeneralizing. To explain the problem, like, so I teach at the law school and the business school, it's an interesting dichotomy. At, the law school is highly politicized, it's highly ideological, and there's a lot of issues, that's where our issues have come up. I teach in the business school, nobody cares about this stuff. We just try to do our job and teach the students and make them graduate and make the school a better place. It, it's the same thing. I've been at various institutions. I spent a couple of years at George Mason. That's not got the same kind of ideological problem mm. as we do. Different fields are different. It, the, the humanities and law tends to be highly ideological, and it's not across the board. Because most of us just like teaching. We want to do our job, and we don't care about this. The highly motivated, ideologically partisan people make all the noise. Mm -hmm. They make all the noise. They get all the attention. The rest of us just don't want to deal with it. And the administration has incentives to respond to the noisy people and ignore everybody else who just wants to get on with life. We have to change the incentives so that the people who make the most noise don't get the response that they want. And that's internal to the organization. Thank you. Those are all fair points. And I think it's appropriate to have the first question go to you, sir. Great. Uh, Ilya Shapiro, Professor Emeritus at Georgetown. <laughs> <laughs> I, I keep using that joke. I'll keep using it until I stop getting laughs. So anyway. Um, so um, I'm writing a book about the illiberal takeover of legal education. I, I think I've solved law schools. You'll have to buy the book next year in time for uh, the admissions uh, cycle. But my question isn't about that. Uh, it's about, so there's a, lot, a great deal of consensus that there aren't really legal issues with, I think Joe mentioned uh, uh, my proposal with Chris Rufo to abolish DEI structures and diversity statements, these systems and processes and things. Okay, no legal issues with that. There's a policy fight. Uh, on the other hand, regulating speech within the classroom, big First Amendment red flags. Mm -hmm. But then there's stuff that Andrew and others have mentioned, curriculum, which departments we have, should we have a you know, uh, transgender black lives uh, activism department and all of you know, that sort of thing, and classes within those departments. So clearly those decisions do need to be made by someone, by definition. Someone has to decide what's taught. Um, is it you know, the Ben Sasses having better presidents uh, at these institutions? Is it trustees and we need to focus on getting better trustees, not just folks who want to like uh, get better football tickets and stuff like this, but who care about stuff? Is it accreditation? 
uh, or is there a role for state legislatures or, 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 or others? Because there's, at different levels, decisions are being made of what to, you know, some university, forget you know, any ideological things, a university could decide, we're gonna be purely about STEM. Conversely, another one is gonna be, we're purely arts, whatever, right? And within each department, okay, uh, you know, we need more military history. We, we don't have anybody that does, uh, you know, this aspect of biophysics or this aspect of cryptography. You know, we need more classes of that, right? So those decisions need to be made. Let's talk about how to affect that sort. Is, that, is it just the legislature? Is that the only tool we have? Uh, or are there other kinds of external pressures, as, as Andrew was saying? Great, thank you. Anyone would like to speak to those? Well, Good questions. I, I guess I'll, I'll just do a quick entry here, which is I think part of the solution is some dif ver different version of there being different layers that are involved with different kind of perspectives on it. I mean, the, the problem is total group think amongst the people who are making decisions at one level or, or the other. And, you know, I get, you know, just as concerned about, you know, getting rid of, you know, tr transgender theory of X, Y, or Z as a class, as I would be about trying to purge the ability to teach conservative, you know, thinking in this context. And I just don't want either of the political leanings to be able to or have the authority to purge the other side. And, and we think that that's happening now. But that's a problem, so I'm not interested in just deciding to say that no, it's us who should be doing the purging, not them who should be doing the purging. You know, so, uh, I, I, so I think that you know, the, the question isn't whether or not there will be human beings, but whether or not there are multiple layers of checks and balances that are all incentivized through the lens of, let's make sure that more ideas are included. You know, because that's the key here, okay. more ideas. Thank you. Mark? Just a quick point. Uh, uh, on, on classroom uh, speech. There is a professional uh, restraint on that articulated by the AAUP in it, its uh, 1940 revision of its 1915 statement on, on academic freedom, which says that the introduction of irrelevant material into the classroom is forbidden. I mean, irrelevant to the, to the core subject and, and the discipline. Anyone else? Uh, two quick observations. One, a lot of the problem has to do with finance. Right? We get paid no matter what product we put out there. It doesn't matter whether it's STEM or you know, some kind of identity studies program. At Georgetown, we're going to get students, we're going to get finance, we're going to get the money no matter what we put out. The lack of connection between the product that we put out and our finance means we can do whatever we want. It's a terrible finance system. The other thing I'm going to say is completely unacceptable. I have to think about whether I should say it or not. But a lot of, I shouldn't say it. What, a lot of what drives the curricular decisions has nothing to do with groupthink or anything else. It has to do with universities' drive to make a diverse faculty. Right? We can't, when we hire, when, if we were well informed, we would know that when we hire, we can't make any decisions based on race, sex, gender, you know, religion, and any of those. We can't use that as a hiring tool. So how can you diversify the faculty? You create positions that only minorities are, will apply for and are best qualified for. And the way to diversify the faculty is to skew the curriculum from physics or biology in a direction that gets more people like that on board. It's a way of dealing with the restrictions the Civil Rights Act imposes on faculty hiring when a main goal of many universities is to have a more diverse faculty. It affects the curriculum in what I think is um, perhaps a negative way, in a way that's not related to what would be the best use of funds to put for students in order to achieve a goal. It's an example of the tail wagging the dog in some ways. Thank you. Um. I think it's kind of all of the above. Um, I, don't, I don't see these as, as like mutually exclusive or dichotomous. Uh, I think that the selection of boards of trustees is one of the probably five most important things any chief magistrate of a state does. 
um, because a board of trustees willing to resist the administrative apparatus and the faculty cabals can do a tremendous amount of work within universities. Um, and I think across the board, both parties, all 50 states, there's a long tradition of rewarding donors, or at least the donor class, with positions on board of trustees. I think that is a mistake. I think it's a huge mistake. Um, personnel is policy at the federal level. It is equally true at the state level. I think the first place that the changes can be made are um, university administrators who come to fear having to explain the insanity on their campuses to a board of trustees who has a hair trigger on firing people. Um, and you're only going to get that if chief magistrates or whatever the system that a particular state has set up for selecting the board um, is willing to kind of break the long-held multi or bipartisan norm of selecting kind of the donor class as a reward. I also am more comfortable, I think, than, than Joe, for example, on legislative solutions. I think one great one is just blow up the tenure granting system. I, I, I have yet to hear a particularly convincing argument about why the, like, the, 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 the group that decides orthodoxy also gets to grant these like lifetime positions. It would be like the judiciary deciding who the next judges are. That makes no sense to me. It doesn't work anywhere else. And I don't, if we're gonna maintain tenure, someone external to the group of tenured people should be making those decisions. Not saying not without consultation with the faculty, because they have to have some understanding of what's important within that market. But letting the current market participants decide who gets to join the monopoly makes no sense to me whatsoever. One, my apologies to my oh, tenured no, friends. No, you're fine. Oh, that's, that's all right. Uh, I, I, yeah. no, no comment on that. Um, are we, Alita, are we going back and forth between the front one and the back one? So the, whoever is at the back mic now, uh, please. Kurt Levy, uh, Committee for Justice. In an earlier panel, uh, we were focusing on, um, you know, woke uh, social media and corporations. Mm -hmm. I asked about, you know, why not expand anti-discrimination laws to include ideological discrimination? And, you know, Casey Maddox had a good point, which was, well, do you really want to put this in the hands of, you know, of bureaucrats and only make the problem worse? But, you know, as I'm sitting here listening to you guys describe how bad it is on the ground, I'm like, if there's one domain that you couldn't make worse, it's academia. I can't imagine it being any way of making it worse. So why not something like, you know, a Title VI or a Title IX um, for ideological discrimination, um, where if you're going to accept federal funds, then you can't discriminate. And I know some of you up there would say that's, you know, would violate the First Amendment, and maybe it'll be challenges, but we don't say under Title IX or Title VI that a school has the right to, if it feel, if it very, you know, it doesn't have free expression to say we don't like uh, black students or we don't like women, um, and I guess I would just, you know, also add, you know, whether you agree with Andrew or not, why don't we see more of, you know, whether it's something like Title VI or, or Title IX, why don't we see more efforts by state legislators to, uh, to outlaw ideological discrimination? I mean, Joe doesn't like banning CRT, but I don't think we would need to if we had more diversity, intellectual diversity. So any reactions to a ban on, quote, ideological discrimination as some part of a solution? Well, you know, I, I, I just, I'm going to start by saying that I do think it can get worse. You know, and I know that that's not what anyone in here wants to see, given the, uh, the gloomy, you know, temperature, uh, you know, that, that, that we all feel is the status quo. But I do think things can get worse. And one way that, you know, that, that uh, reason why I think this is because under at least the status quo with First Amendment litigation, some of the people that are victims of some of the most egregious things that we are concerned about win. They win in court. And now it takes courage to file suit, uh, of course, and not everyone does. Um, and that's not the ideal thing to have to rely upon. But I don't want to really shift law to not prioritize those individual you know, uh, rights. Now, I'm not weighing in necessarily on the question of adding political class as a protected status. That's been done in a number of states. Um, you know, I, I, I think there's some positives and some, and some negatives uh, to it. But I just say, careful what we wish for. Modesty, you know, will, will go a long way to, 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 le to leading to really good policy. Mark? Uh, I, well, Joe, I believe some states do include political affiliation in their anti-discrimination. But that's, that's easy. That's clear. Democrat, Republican, ideological, 
awfully fuzzy, right? How do you, where, where, where do you set, what's your ideology kind of thing? Yeah, two quick comments. Um, if you made discrimination on ideological viewpoints actionable, all we would do is sue each other because that's what the disputation is about, ideology. The other quick observation is based on something you said in the last panel. In D.C., under the Human Rights Act, political affiliation is a basis for discrimination. I'm going to just give this out as an advertisement. I've been trying to convince a law student to work with me writing a law review article for a long time showing that under the disparate impact theory of discrimination, Georgetown University should be being sued for not having enough Republicans and that it's a, we need to write an article saying that they're discriminating on political affiliation, disparate impact shows it. So if anybody would like to publish that with me, get in touch. So there you go. I mean, if anybody would like to sue Georgetown, just come up front here and uh, we, can, we can go ahead and do that. Just kidding. That's a joke. One quick response. My understanding of, of one of the objections to this was, well, do we want to have bureaucrats making these decisions? They are. I don't know what you think goes on at the universities. They are. The question is not whether, it's which. The ones that aren't accountable because they get tenure protection, uh, or they're responding to the incentives of the tenured, or ones that when we find out about it, we can go to someone and say, fix it or we vote you out. And that, that's kind of my view here is, present company excluded, I don't see particularly public universities as sort of distinct categories of government organs from the other big agencies. They are government organs. When they do bad stuff, they get to interpose sovereign immunity. I mean, they are the government. And so the question is not, should the government, it's which part, and I just have a strong preference for the part we can change as the governed, as opposed to a kind of insulated cabal. And I guess, you know, we've been beating around the bush about this disagreement here, but I'll, I'll get straight to the heart of, of, of where, I, where I believe the tension is, which is the special nature of academic freedom is that this is the one place where we're supposed to be challenging the status quo. This is the one place where all of the ideas, all of the ideas are supposed to be fair to debate. And history is filled with the big G, capital G government. And I, you know, of course public institutions are also government actors. We sue them under the First Amendment all the time. But when you start inviting big G government to have pressure and the ability and the authority to remove ideas and give them that authority uh, without redress under the First Amendment, you know, as is currently the status quo when faculty are ironing that out, uh, the political incentives of, of in a polarized society of whichever side is in the majority trying to stamp out the other are incredibly high. And that's not to say that this isn't happening on the ground already because I do agree uh, with uh, the Solicitor General on that point, but, I, but we're happy to litigate and fight that every time that we see it you know, from fire you know, and do it you know, regularly and often on behalf of people through litigation and even not through litigation with advocacy as Mr. Shapiro can you know, attest. So, you know, I, I, I just, I worry about what it means when you're replacing, we say it's the accountability. I don't know there is much accountability in the electorate for, versus constitutional rights of free speech when free speech is supposed to protect, protect minority views from the majoritarian view. That's but, the whole point of free speech. Well, let's, let's get another question. Go ahead. Okay, Chris Newman, Scalia Law. I wanted to follow up on something that Joe said, if I, if I understood correctly, that you were interested in some kind of a norm that might say you're not supposed to um, rule out dissenters at the hiring stage. Or, uh, and and the, the problem is, right, what you're going to hear is, well, you don't want to force the geology department to hire flat earthers, right? Mm -hmm. It's not because... You know, if, the, if, the, if there is a search for truth going on in the university, there is going to ultimately be consensus that certain ideas just, it's not that we're ideologically biased against them, we're political activists, it's just that there's some things that have been disproven and it's, not a, it's a waste of our time. And I think most liberal faculty members actually believe, they think that they are following the objective search for truth that we're all saying they should be doing. It's not their fault that conservative ideas are all tantamount to flat earthism. I mean, and so the question is how, I'm curious, how, how, would, how do you deal with that? I mean, that's, that's exactly putting the thumb on the difficulty here. And, you know, we've tried to grapple with that with our own, you know, model legislation that says that, you know, when, you know, you're evaluating uh, institutional hire that taking into consideration a person's work in their subject matter expertise is different than saying, you know, you're in the engineering department, but what's your view on DEI, 
right? So you're allowing it to consider, consider their substantive body of work in the space. That doesn't mean that there will be no ideological calls that are being you know, made there. Uh, I don't know that there's any statutory way you can prevent that from ever happening on the ground to perfection without error. Um, but that's how we're trying to tinker with that. It's a very hard thing to get exactly right, which is why we revisit and revisit and revisit our language. In the back there. Thank you. I'm Greg Dolan from University of Baltimore. And as a tenured faculty member at a law school in a blue state, as well as somebody who is currently litigating a case where federal judges do try to pick their colleague, or re really dispick their colleague, I can tell you it can't get worse. So my question is actually fairly narrow. If we do blow up the tenure system, A, I hope it doesn't affect me, but B, more, <coughs> more You'll importantly, be okay. <laughs> uh, what will replace it? And given that I teach at the University of Baltimore in one of the blue states in the nation, as an originalist, as a conservative, I am not quite sure that I would get a better shake out of the state legislature than I would get out of my colleagues as bad as they might be. Hmm. And um, so if we farm out hiring or if we farm our tenure to politically responsible people, which certainly has some superficial appeal, how will we deal with the fact that those people do have to respond to their voters who will probably them, you voted for, to give tenure to this guy or to that guy on the right or the left, et cetera. Why do you think that will be better than what we have now, as bad as what we have now is? Do you want to take that first, Andrew? Sure. Um, I want to revert to something that Professor Bauerlein said right at the top of his remarks, which is, um, and I don't agree with the first part, but I'm going to repeat it, which is, is there no better signal of the failure of American conservatism than the state of large universities in red states? So I do not argue mostly because I haven't thought about it well enough, uh, but I don't argue that things will get better everywhere if we subject a lot of these decisions to political accountability, but they will get better in a lot of places, lots of places where you have, you know, um, large universities publicly funded that are like exclaves of tremendously progressive orthodoxy in states that if they knew the political identity or they saw a pie chart of the ideological identity of their faculty would say, this is outrageous, we aren't paying for this anymore. Get some ideological diversity here, this is nuts. So, you know, I, it, it sort of sounds like I'm saying maybe we have to sacrifice conservatives at the University of Baltimore to achieve a greater good. I'm not quite saying that, but I am saying that there are lots of places where changing this system would be a dramatic improvement, even if there are other places where it's kind of like a wash. <laughs> Uh, Mark? Just a quick thing about, about tenure. Uh, I love tenure. Tenure was fantastic. I had it for 25 years. It was great. I agree. But the, uh, <laughs> the, the, the thing is that tenure is such a high stakes moment. It's either, you know, a job for life, golden handcuffs, or it's, you're done. And especially in fields where the job market is awful. I mean, the chances are if you don't, you know, now if you don't get tenure in the humanities, you're probably done in getting any regular job, which means that junior faculty are maniacal about ensuring that the threshold is, is passed. It makes the pressures of conformity, right? You become 100% other directed man here. And that the free thought, the free inquiry, uh, the, the, you know, the gadfly, you know, the young Turk, you know, you, you used to be the, the, those young ones. That, that, I, I haven't heard an, an original fresh statement come out of the mouth of an assistant professor in 20 years in the humanities. And it's not their fault. They're smart. They're, they're, they're learned. Most of them are consci conscientious teachers but my goodness, it's my life, right? And, and, and so the narrowing, right? Again, the, 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 the coercion, the system really does squelch. Uh, and it's one reason why the humanities are such dead zones and have been for quite a while. If I just can real very quickly jump in and say that, you know, I think it's a smart question to be asking about whether or not tenure can be replaced with something better and something more thoughtful. And I don't oppose, you know, having the entertaining that that, that kind of question, but I deal with a daily, 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 you know, uh, 
event which I see, which is that we have enough lawmakers across the country, there's at least one of them calling for a faculty member they disagree with to be, you know, to be you know, punished or fired or what have you across the country. It's so freaking common that I'm constantly telling my colleagues that they can't tell that those lawmakers that they should take a hike or that they're un-American or what have you, and instead say, let me engage them and explain to them why that's you know, problematic and see if we can you know, adjust this differently. And I just worry about if it's good for the goose, it's good for the gander. And I don't think it will be a wash. I think it's going to be really bad for minority viewpoints, whichever view is in the minority in the particular location. I think we have time for one more question. Alan, do you want to? Sure, Alan Gurr, Institute for Free Speech. I guess my question is directed more towards uh, Professor Hasnes, but the rest of you guys can chime in. Um, why can't a state decide that it has an interest in uh, academic freedom and remove through the political process the administrators who are not producing it just as they might be removed for otherwise being ineffective? And towards that end, uh, perhaps separately, uh, does the state have an interest not just in uh, academic freedom but in viewpoint diversity? Uh, as a means of proving that, so that perhaps uh, uh, there might be a role to say, look, the next uh, professor at the school uh, needs to be more right of center considering that it's 99% Marxist here. Question. Yeah. I'm not sure I understand the question. I, I've actually written an article on the need for viewpoint diversity and how easy it is to achieve if there was the will to do it. And the reason why we don't has to do with something else having to do with the, the desire to get demographic diversity. But if your question was, what's wrong with politicians making the decisions about this inside universities, then the answer, I th you know, I'm going to have to give a very facile, easy answer, that's the last thing that we want. It's not like this hasn't happened before. The 1950s and the McCarthy era was all about political influence on the entertainment industry and the academic world. And I always use that as an example with my students because of what ended those practices. And what ended those practices were two brave men. That was Louis Neiser and John Henry Falk who sued the people behind the blacklist and got a judgment that ended the blacklist the next day. People standing up for their rights and fighting back by standing on their rights is what we need more of. The last thing I want to see is the politicians trying to do that for us because in the 50s, it was the House on American Affairs activity that was putting the pressure on everybody to kick out all the left-wing people. It's too dangerous. I mean, Joe's got, I agree with Joe, almost all the way down the line until he gets to his finely nuanced little um, laws that will just guarantee neutrality. There's a good theoretical answer to every problem by passing a law. There's a, theory, a, a law that will work in theory for every problem. And that's irrelevant, because all we have is the real world with real political influences. And no matter how theor theoretically ideal the statute is, you, we know from experience politicians are not going to stick to that. They're going to do what advances their own political interests, and that are, that's almost always to go in a particular direction that you know, curries favor with voters. We're much better keeping that entirely out. We you open the door a little bit, and we're dead. Um, we are, I am, I'm sorry, we are out of time, and so I need to ask Alita to come up and close out uh, this panel and the conference yes. all together. But thank you, thank you very much for a stimulating discussion. And um, yes, it's very sad to close this out because it's been an amazing day, but please join me in thanking all of our panelists and moderators for today's discussion. Um, I also want to thank our audience for um, their um, attendance and also for your engagement and participation in the conversation today. Um, you're all invited to join us across the hall where we had lunch um, for a closing reception. This concludes the programming portion of the conference today. We are adjourned. Thank you.